take a deep breath and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this moment to be together where in person I get to welcome you to First Parish in Portland for in-person worship. This is a moment. This is a, an, a, a moment of emergence from emergency. We have so much going on in the world, in our lives. To be here together is so special. So I am welcoming you to this wonderful congregation, which is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. So we are not alone in our celebrations today. On this very first post-pandemic in-person service for 100 members and friends, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you all and to anyone who might be visiting us for the first time, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whoever you love, whatever your gender identity or faith tradition, your culture, we have made a place here for you to be amongst us. Our membership coordinator, Lori Hasty, wave your hand, Lori, for those who may not know you, will be here to greet you in the parlors. If you are a newcomer, we're having a tea, well, a moment, a non-eating, drinking moment to share with you anything we and answer all your questions about First Parish. So the parlors are over there and just follow us there after the service. We are also very excited today to welcome a new member of our staff. John, would you like to introduce Matthew? Use a microphone, John, your mask, yeah. Use your microphone right there. Yeah. I'd like to introduce our new staff accompanist, Matthew Jones. Every week here, we acknowledge both virtually, hello to wave, turn and wave to all the people who may be watching on live stream. Hello. We remember that we stand, sit, work, play, on sacred ground. This land that our building is occupying has been the site of human activity for thousands of years. So we pause each Sunday to remember the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy, whose lives and land were taken through genocidal strategies of colonial settlement of this land. We pay respect to the elders, both past and present who comprise the Wabanaki Confederacy, those members of the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq people who have stewarded this land for generations. We recognize that there have been repeated atrocities, violations of their sovereignty, their territory, treaties, water privileges that have impacted the original inhabitants and continue to impact the members of those tribes today. So with deep respect for their tradition, their values, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity, the sovereignty of the nations. We support their efforts for land and water protection and restoration and for the cultural healing and recovery that is necessary today. We pledge our commitment to the ongoing work of decolonization in Maine and beyond. So please pause with me for a moment in that acknowledgement. I want to remind you now that we're back in person, tables with candles for any joy, concern, remembrance that you would like to add. We invite you to get up anytime during the music or the meditation to light a candle. I also want to remind you that we are very grateful to our ushers today. And if you are interested in ushering on a Sunday, please see Lori and volunteer for that important role. 
We also want to remember that we are cherishing the youngest members. And the reason we're wearing masks is it's not as important for adults, but we cherish our youngsters. And I want you to, behind those masks, be smiling at them, appreciating their turtles and movements during the service because our families and our children are our future. So since February 20th, we have been, been engaging our members and friends in a campaign of stewardship. Who here doesn't know that we've been working on stewardship? So I want to invite at this time, Tom Rogers and Leslie Runzer to come forward and give us their stewardship story. Good morning. My name is Leslie Runcer, and I'm Tom Rogers. <laughs> um, when we were asked to do a stewardship testimonial this year, we decided to try something a bit different. So today we're inviting you basically into our living room to listen to a condensed version of a conversation we had recently when we were discussing our pledge for this year. So Imagine us, not in fancy clothes, <laughs> in sweatpants, sitting on our living room couch. Yep. You know, Tom, between Zoom services, Christina's departure, and then Scott's departure, things at church feel different to me, and I'm feeling disconnected and a bit discouraged. I get it. I feel that way too, Leslie. I bet everyone at First Parish you know, um, experiences something like what we're experiencing too, at uh, one level or another. And, you know, it really seems like the church is at an important crossroads. And now we're being asked to significantly increase our pledge. I know, I know. And two years ago, we increased it by 50%. And there are so many other important causes we want to support right now. You know, I wouldn't want to be alone in increasing our pledge. I would really want it to be a church-wide commitment. Uh, well, maybe we don't increase it this year? Well, think about the hard work going on behind the scenes at First Parish much of which we've been oblivious to because we've been signing on via Zoom. Uh, I mean, every staff person and every committee member has been doing their part to help First Parish through this challenging time. I wish I could thank them all in person. Oh, I guess I can. Thank you, thank you everybody. <laughs> I love that church leaders reached out to members to check in and request nominations for the ministerial search committee a couple months ago. I feel like Robin Elaine is providing the leadership. <laughs> First Paris needs right now. Her vision for the church to be in a strong position when our new minister comes on board is compelling. That will provide the new minister with the financial and staffing resources necessary to really hit the ground running. It's true, it's true. And remember all the things First Parish has given us over the years. I got over my fear of public speaking in that pulpit. <laughs> we found community and a spiritual home. Remember all the Thanksgiving dinners and pageants, child dedications and coming of age ceremonies chalice groups and community dinners and all that wonderful, beautiful music. Through good times and hard times, we found encouragement, support, and most of all, a beloved community right here. We don't wanna let that community down, do we? Don't we wanna do our part to help? So I guess it's time to go big or go home. Sounds right to me. I'm already feeling more connected. I want First Parish to thrive into the future. Sure, we both do a lot, 
for First Parish, and maybe right now we can do some more. Let's mm. step up to do our part. Hmm. Okay. Let's increase our pledge by another 50%. Will you join us? Please join us in pledging generously to First Parish. The future, the future is, is you. us yes. or you <laughs> use. <laughs> Thank you both for your commitment and your expertise at public speaking. We have two reasons to celebrate today. One of course is being in person in the church again in the meeting house. And the other is some of you may know is that this is Reverend Elaine's birthday. <laughs> uh, 70th. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted this to say that. <laughs> oh. oh, you are really good at keeping a surprise. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That means so much to me. Thank you. What a, what a treat. And, so, and um, I want you to know what an honor and a privilege it has been to work with you so far. We have much more to do. <laughs> well, not, not, there's much that we are still have ahead of us to do. And today is such a monumental moment, not just a birthday, but a milestone in the time that you've experienced over the last two years. And certainly I have as well. So I am so, so grateful to be here and sharing that with you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to, um, on the behalf of the whole membership, wish you good fortune, good health, and good times in the year to come. And on ordinary times, we would sing happy birthday to you, of course, but these are not ordinary times. So Matthew, I think, is ready to play happy birthday. Is that right? Maybe. No. Okay. Oh, just, no. Anyway. Anyway, okay, good. He can so wing we, it. We can I'm all sure. clap and make noise, not not singing, not singing. Well done, Matthew. Well done. We now know that you can perform spontaneously. Yes, right. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I invite you to give your attention to the prelude as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
Thank you, Una Voce. You have been steadfast with us, live and virtual, and your gifts are so appreciated. Our opening words were written by Rebecca Parker. She was the um, head of our UU Theological School in California, Start King, and she's a longtime UU minister and theologian. In the midst of a world marked by tragedy and beauty, there must be those who bear witness against unnecessary destruction and who with faith stand to lead in freedom with grace and love. There must be those who speak honestly and do not avoid seeing what must be seen of sorrow and outrage, of tenderness and wonder. There must be those whose grief troubles the water while their voices sing and speak of refreshed worlds and a new vision. There must be those whose exuberance rises with lively, lovely energy that articulates Earth's joys and hope. There must be those who are restless for respectful, loving companionship among human beings whose presence invites people to be themselves without fear. And there must be those who gather with every congregation of remembrance and compassion, draw water from old wells and walk the simple path of love thy neighbor. These communities of people who seek to do justice love kindness and walk humbly with their dog, their God, call on the strength of soul force to heal, transform and bless life. It is important that we remember there must always be religious witness. We're gonna light our chalice after we sing one more song. Circle round from freedom with our choir. I invite you when any of the songs, we can't sing together, but we can hum. So if you know the tunes, 
please come. We're going to light the chalice today, a chalice of light to face the world's coldness, a chalice of warmth to face the world's terror, our chalice of courage, to face the world's turmoil, a chalice of peace, and to rekindle our faith, a flame of hope. Please join me in the covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is our prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love and to help one another to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Tobin, is here in person to share a story for all ages. Welcome. Good morning, children. Oh my goodness, it's been two years since I've gotten to say that here from this chair. So good morning, children. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be with you all. So back pre-COVID days, I would call all the children up, but today I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna invite you to stay with your families. But I did see some children's faces. I saw Josephine, I saw Ellen, I saw Destiny, I saw Jordan, I saw Jerome, I saw Wynn and I saw Rosalie. And I'm sure there's um, other childlike hearts out there. And if there's any other childlike faces I didn't see, I can't wait to see you in just a little bit. So the way that it works on a Sunday morning when we have kids in the service is that we will all start together. We will light our chalice I will come up and tell a story. And then we used to sing the children out. And so we won't be singing because we're not there yet, but who remembers the song that we used to sing the children out to? People remember, does anybody remember what it was called? What was it called? Yeah, it was called, We Will Keep a Place for You. And how true those words are. You know, a few years ago, I switched our song to We Will Keep a Place for You. And I did a little talk about it during Stewardship Month because uh, I feel like it's a really important dedication and a really important statement to our children. The words of the song are, we will keep a place for you wherever you may go. We'll sustain this home of faith and love you've come to know. Go in peace, bring hope to hearts that yearn, we will keep a place for you until you return. And today, the children have returned. And you truly did keep a place for them. And as hard as it has been to be away from the children, I always say, I, I do better when my heart is in the same room as children. <laughs> and then it's been really nice to have like my heart in the same Zoom as children, but there's something extra special about being here with you all today and about getting a chance to be with the children. And I thank you so much for honoring that vow to the children, for truly being people who care enough to keep a place for them to go. They are our future. Um, and I can't wait to see this church filled back up with children. Um, and so we're going to, I'm gonna ask my teachers here. This is, this is Ray Jett, who is one of our teachers. And this is Samson Spadafore, who is our other teacher. We're not gonna sing the children out, but we are gonna play them out. And what I'm going to have you do, can you demonstrate for me? We're going to try this new thing, especially since we're not really singing, where we're going to make an arch in the center aisle. So if you are in the center aisle and you're on like an outside seat, I want you to follow the actions of Sam and Ray. So if you're on the outside, go ahead and stand up and you're going to help make an arch. And now we want to make sure that we're keeping plenty of space for our kids to pass through, but if you have a noisemaker, you can use that. You can do whatever you want to honor them. And I want you to imagine that this arch is gonna take forever someday because we're gonna have so many kids coming through it. Now, if you're, if you're a kid and you wanna come down to a children's chapel downstairs, 
what I would like you to do is head towards the back of the church if you're not near the middle rows and come down that center aisle where you see all of these adults holding space for you. Um, do you think that you could play? We will keep a place for you. Thank you. So come on down children. Make your way down the center aisle. Thank you. That is our new tradition. We will do that every week. So if you really want to be an archer, sit on the end of the pew and then you get to be an archer. I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer or meditation. This is the time in our service each week where we take deep breaths to acknowledge our own lives the lives of our fellow members, the world around us, in a way that expands our hearts and our minds so we can actually wrap ourselves around all that changes, that is churning in our world. There's way we practice drawing our circle wide to take in the candles lit on each side of the uh, meeting house in the way to bring gratitude to the joys, help lift up the burden of loss and to have compassion for all the sorrow. Breathe with me. Allow your breath to relax your body, expand your heart, and open your mind. For this moment, take in the world's fears right now, your own fears, your questions, uncertainty. There is a woman, Lynn McTaggart, who's invited the world to join her in a meditation of intention, an intention of peace in Ukraine. She invites us, and I invite you, to take that next deep breath And when you exhale, let go of any judgments or preconceptions. No wordsmithing of an intention. Allow these few words to settle into you. To surrender yourself to them just for this moment. Letting go of those fears, anxiety. Focusing your intention and attention only on peace. With all of your heart and mind, repeat in your mind, all people, lay down your arms. May we all lay down our arms for the world. Lay down your arms. Lay down your arms. We repeat this mantra as often as we need to 
to send our intentions for peace, spreading it far, our circle wide. Always, we share in this moment that we may heal and not harm, that we may help and not hinder each other, the world, as we all strive to serve the greatest good. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. I invite you to hum along with the choir as we enjoy the spirit of life. I took the reading for today from a favorite meditation book. It's called Meditations from the Mat, and it's by Rolf Gates, who's my most inspiring yoga teacher. He has this meditation, you know, one of those you read one every day, and he began one recently with the Indigo Girls, Indigo Girls song, uh, Closer to Fine. Darkness has a hunger that's insatiable, and lightness has a call that is hard to hear. We spend our days badgered by voices that tell us to judge others, fear others, harm others or ourselves. We are not obligated to listen to those voices or even to take responsibility for them. They may be where we come from, but they are not where we are going. There is another voice that shines. Ahimsa is the practice of listening to that voice of lightness, cultivating that voice, trusting that voice, acting upon that voice. Ahimsa, the voice of nonviolence to self or other. So thank you for noticing my birthday today. I have to say that 70 is a bit daunting. Truthfully, I never thought I'd live this long. Did anybody else think that when they turned seven? Yeah, and I, I'm told that 80 is even more of a marker. So I've been thinking about this and I've talked to John, I've talked to Tobin. I've been thinking about what does it mean to age well? What does it mean to walk through your life with an intention to be better next year or to, to be able to approach the end of your life with no regrets, no fears, a sense of well done. I was walking down the street uh, yesterday and I've been practicing uh, Lynn McTaggart's intention. She invites everybody at nine o'clock Pacific every morning, which is noon for us, to share in that uh, intention for peace in Ukraine. And she has a much longer statement than lay down your arms, but I couldn't remember it. So I sort of 
shortened it because I could remember lay down your arms and I could feel that. So at noon every day, I, wherever I am, I pause and I breathe and I say, lay down your arms, lay down your arms. And she's had a lot of success over the 20 years she's been teaching about intention. She's practiced like 40 of these intention experiments and they focus mostly on nonviolence and peace. And she's, there's been recorded data that shows wherever she focuses her intention, whether it's on a neighborhood in St. Louis or in Jerusalem with Palestinians and Jews, or whether it was in Kandahar with Muslims and um, Christians, that there is a noticeable reduction in violence. And the reduction doesn't just happen in the environment of the community in which she's focusing her intention. The most important thing is what it does in the parts of the people that are sharing this intention. So yesterday I had to go to the library and it was raining, remember? It was cold and rainy yesterday. And I was walking with Gussie and I said, well, I'll put Gussie in stay in that little, I'll, right in the beginning part of this, as you go through the doors, but it's not into the library. So I brought her in, I put her in stay and the librarian came out and said, oh, is that your dog? And I said, we don't allow any dogs in the building. I said, well, just here, cause it's raining. And, and she said, I'm so sorry, but because of allergies, no dogs, not even service dogs. And I was like, so I had to walk the dog back, and put her into, her into the office and I'm like a little frustrated. And then it was noon. So I'm going, lay down your arms, <laughs> lay down your arms. And what I realized is that it was about me laying down my frustrations, laying down my judgment. And I felt this sort of calm, and appreciation for that librarian's courage to be able to confront this ornery woman who wanted to come in to the library with her dog. And I, when I went back to the library without Gussie, I was able to thank her for her, for her integrity and for managing me and go about my library business. So these intentions are important that ahimsa moment, to have something that allows you, us, each of us, to lay down our arms, to lay down our judgments, to lay down our frustrations, our fears, our uncertainty, to for a moment expand the compassion in our hearts for ourselves and for other. Intentions call us this day, each day, to mature politically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, to learn how to relate to one another responsibly, respectfully, to hold boundaries appropriate for our bodies, our minds, our spirits, for this very precious earth. So I'm coming of age, finally. And I thought about this as I thought about all the coming of age programs I've worked with as a minister in the different congregations I've served, teaching our youngsters their values, the, the ability to have boundaries, to care for self, mind, spirit, and every time I'm reminded that we are eternally coming of age. It isn't something magical that happens at the age of 13. There, done with that, passed. Mm -mm. From birth to death, we are always coming of age. It's a choice, I must admit, it is a choice. I've made that choice, some of you may have, to improve in body, mind, or spirit each year, to learn something new, 
to challenge ourselves, to grow. Last Sunday, I want you to know, I took a full day ski lesson, black diamond from nine to four. I did moguls and said to myself and my instructor, this is what 70 looks like. <laughs> Coming of age, right? The most important consideration, and I had to think of this last Sunday, is in coming of age, we set ourselves goals that challenges us, challenge, but don't kill us. Right? I'm not going over any cliffs and I'm not doing any flips. I don't need to go there. But there is a sense of I can improve my stamina, my strength, my control. We can improve our ability to be compassionate, non judgmental spiritually mature and to balance the right amount of challenge with the right amount of success. You don't want to continually putting something in front of yourself that you can't achieve. So you're always feeling bad about yourself. I don't know if I'll ever speak Spanish. I'm still thinking about the piano. What can we take on? at the age of five, 10, 30, 50, 70, that brings 80, 90, I'm going, I'm, I'm 90. So it's important to have a focus on coming of age, always. It's important to have an intention, a mantra that you have for yourself that inspires, calms, improves who you are that gives you a goal because people move in the direction of their intentions. And the more positive your intention, the more positive and courageous and strength filled your steps will be. The momentum for any large scale change as Lynn Taggart is trying to produce is determined by the percentage of people who are involved. The more people actively engage in the process of change and transformation, the more possible that transformation is. So we can all have a moment. When you say that mantra, lay down your arms, it not only shifts your heart to ahimsa, nonviolence, but for me, it gives me some sense that I'm doing something, that I am not helpless in this moment, only floating in the current of what the world is producing. It gives me ownership. It gives me license. It gives me the sense that I too am participating, unfolding what is to be unfolded. So intention is a direction that we choose with our thoughts, with our hearts, and then we move in the direction of the image of our future. So be wise, be courageous, be intentional about your future. First Parish is coming of age too. You are transitioning between ministers, music directors, futures. It's important for you to recognize and have an intention between the past and the future. Where do you want to go? Who do you want to be? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to hold on to? What balanced vision that is achievable can you create and hold together? Can you hold your intention on vitality, on relevance, on a place for you, a place for music, a place to be a leader a historic leader 
in the city of Portland. Coming of age is all about rethinking what you know, questioning your construction of reality, reshaping your beliefs in its most simple analysis. Coming of age is wise discernment. Discernment simply of what to let go of and what to hold on to. Using ahimsa, nonviolence. So you're letting go and holding on without rigidity or violence. Lay down your arms. Listen for the voice of lightness, nonviolence, no greed, no hate. Surrendering and letting go of that voice, that hunger that is insatiable. Ultimately, we must let go of everything, material goods, relationships, life. And I think coming of age is about that practice of letting go continually so that when it's time to let go of life, we're prepared, we're practiced. We've learned what is essential to living well. There's a story about, anybody know the monkey in the cage? There's a way the Indians uh, practice catching monkeys. So what they do is they get a big board and they nail, well, first they, they take a coconut and they cut it in half and they carve out all the coconut inside and they leave the coconut on the board. And then they take the half a coconut shell and they carve a little hole in the top, just big enough for that monkey to get her hand into but not big enough to haul out a chunk of coconut. So it is proven very effective. No monkey will let go of the coconut. So they sit there struggling, they're, they're, they can't get their hand out. It's a very kind and humane way to capture monkeys because it doesn't hurt them, frustrates them, but doesn't hurt them. So as long as that monkey is holding onto that coconut, they're captured. Don't we all have our little piece of coconut, maybe big piece of coconut that we hold on to, a grudge, a judgment, a prejudice, a frustration, a dream, a desire, a must have. What is your piece of coconut? It is so important. Your hand locked on that thing to release it. Remove your hand and enjoy that ahimsa moment of freedom. No longer controlled by whatever that is, that is your piece of coconut. I'm not sure why when I was revamping the sermon this morning, I always come in at eight and kind of go through and toss things around and fix them. And what kept coming to my mind was this quote that I remembered from like high school when I read Cry the Beloved Country, Alan Payton's book. There was a line in the book that said, fear will rob us of all we are if we love too much. And I think it's about the coconut because the hardest things to let go of, I think, are the things we love so much. Maybe not the destructive parts of our nature, but the fear of losing something is probably the most challenging thing to be able to surrender, to release. Fear will rob us of all, if we love too much.
our hearts have the capacity to grow big. One of the things that's told in almost all of the world's great teachings that we expand our hearts with the ability to take in suffering, to be able to not avoid suffering, to be able to take in all the tragedies that we see on the television and the world around us. Because our hearts don't, um, aren't selectively growing large. So a spiritual practice of facing the realities of the world not only increases your capacity to hold on to the tensions, the uncertainty, the anxiety of what's happening. At the same time, it increases your capacity for joy, for love, because a big heart that can take in what's happening in the world right now without turning away also is big enough to love more, be more kind, be more compassionate. So coming of age is about growing our hearts big. And the world needs us to do exactly that right now. We need to expand the volume of life we can take in without losing ourselves. Shrinking souls will not survive this moment, not this emergence from a pandemic, not the threats to the environment, not the threats of war. This is no time for shrinking hearts. It is imperative that we adopt effective means to maintain our integrity, to expand our hearts, to live our values, discovering, collaborating, loving all, whether they are vastly different from us or not. We need communities like this one. This is so important that First Parish be here as a religious witness, a witness to what a faith community can accomplish, can model, can send out to the world in intention. There are no principles or values more needed in the world than ours right now. So do not take this congregation for granted or your place in it, or your intention for it. It is essential that these pews be filled with all ages, that that intention flows out of these windows, that you can make your mark at this moment in the history of Portland and the world. It was Carter Hayward who wrote years ago, she was one of the first women ordained as a priest. And she says that what we do with our strength matters. That our strength, our love, our intentions for this world are the ongoing incarnation of God in the world, a God whose name in history is love. May our intentions flow from this space into the world with love. Namaste. I invite you to enjoy our closing hymn, We Would Be One. Hum.
Thank you, First Parish Choir. An offering in person. Our ushers will come forward and gratefully receive your gifts, all your gifts, our contributions to the well being and the vitality of this meeting house and the congregation that resides in it. Please be generous. All your gifts are holy.
in the midst of a world marked by tragedy and beauty. There must be those who, with faith, stand and lead with grace. May each of our lives be a witness, bearing witness to the courage in faith that people can be true to life and love, that there is still religious witness for the good of all. May it be so. Now I invite you to share in the chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again next Sunday. Thank you.